This is Texans TV. Texans 360 is now. We're so excited that you're with us on a very special edition of the show. My name's Drew Doherty. I'm your host outside NRG Stadium. Today, we got some quarterbacks in Gerard Johnson and Case Keenum, plus a guy who threw a touchdown pass for the Texans and Cecil Shorts headed to Galveston for a very special history lesson. But we begin things with one of the best stories you're ever going to hear. Uh, my name is Brad Wilson. I'm with Harris County Emergency Corps, and I'm the team paramedic for the Houston Texans. Roland Ramirez, Director of Player Care and Sports Medicine, uh, head athletic trainer for the Texans. In high school, I knew I wanted to go into uh, sports medicine. I discovered athletic training. Ever since then, I, I wanted to be uh, a rehab coordinator at the highest level and have you know, found a career in the NFL, which has just been incredible. Uh, for me going into my 19th season uh, overall in the NFL. Roland is one of a kind. He's a great friend. Uh, I've known him for probably 14 years. Uh, I knew him a little bit before I started with the Texans. And he's just, he's a great guy. He's a great family guy. He's a great professional. Um, he's just a terrific human being. We've been together uh, quite a while here in Houston. Uh, and he's been, been our team paramedic for a long time, so been good friends since then. Depending on, on the trips, I mean, sometimes we, we get together, we'll, we'll get a, grab a bite to eat, uh, go hang out for, for a little bit, you know, after treatment session. It just depends on what's going on with the team. Every once in a while, we'll hang out, um, you know, outside of just the norm, you know, for us, and just to kind of relax a little bit before game day uh, the next day. That night, um, we had debated whether we were going to stay at the hotel and hang out, or um, we were talking about going to the Nashville Predators game. We couldn't really get tickets. It was kind of a, a hassle. Sure enough, I found some general admission tickets that were reasonable, so we went ahead and got the tickets. and. Um, decide we were going to go to the hockey game. You know, Brad was being himself, um, no unusual signs uh, and or symptoms that, that he expressed at all. Um, we were, we just walked from the hotel all together. Coldest day of the year there, it was, it was supposed to be nine degrees uh, at game time. So yeah, it was, it was a little cold. We'll just go catch the, at least the third period um, and, uh, you know, enjoy a Predators game for a little bit and then we'll come back to the hotel, no problem. And we walked down to the arena and um, once we got in there we kind of congregated to figure out what we were going to do and while we were deciding everything I wanted to look into the team shop just to look for some souvenirs, some t-shirts, to see what I could maybe get the family and then when I was in there that's when basically everything went dark. I passed out at that point. I asked one of my assistants, I said, hey, you know, where, where's Brad? And uh, they said he went down to grab a, uh, a jersey or, or an item for his wife and family. And there was a lady at the top of the stairs that uh, started to uh, just say, hey, is there, is there a medical doctor uh, around? Any, any medical doctor here? And so, um, you know, I jokingly said, you know, well, there is, there's a paramedic in there. there there's a, our, cause I knew, you know, what our team paramedic was in there, of course. And so I said, well, there's a paramedic in there. And she continued to ask for a doctor. And I thought it was uh, a little strange just because there was really no commotion in the store. We kind of scurried over a little bit, wondering what was going on. And then I noticed Brad. Brad was the one that had collapsed and was on the floor. And so that's when uh, we rushed in and realized that, uh, that Brad was in cardiac arrest. I remember looking at, uh, at jerseys and next thing I remember I woke up in the ambulance. I didn't feel anything different. I didn't see any lights. I didn't hear anything different. I just, one minute I was looking at jerseys and the next minute I was in the ambulance. Essentially it's, it's just where your heart stops, right? And you have no pulse. Um, in this case, um, where we 
checked pulse um, in, in both arms. He had what uh, was called agonal breathing. Uh, also had no pulse uh, that my other assistant, uh, you know, confirmed at his carotid pulse in his neck. Immediately, you know, got him on his back uh, and started to um, start CPR. We continued to do CPR until the medics arrived and uh, got the AED, uh, which is the automated external defibrillator. And so applied that onto to Brad's chest um, and shocked him, had to shock him twice. Getting a normal heart rhythm is, is what is the most important thing. And I think we got it probably within uh, five minutes or so. Um, and then after that, he was transported to the hospital. So we're going to go up the back elevator. The McNairs are going to go in first with their gift, and then we'll cue everybody else to come in as like the second wave of the surprise. We just have to be quiet outside that door when we're upstairs so he doesn't suspect that anybody's outside. It's special uh, to be able to sit here across uh, from Brad, knowing uh, what that situation was, and just to have the chance to, you know, again, still joke around with them and go through our everyday life in the NFL together, and uh, just to enjoy funny moments and laughs in the training room, and just to, to have him uh, continue to help our team and you know serve our team together has just been, it's just been neat. That's awesome. Um, just look right behind you real quick, Roland. Hey! <laughs> What's up? There are you guys. Well, we brought you a little something. Listen, you guys, we're really proud that y'all are Texans. Been with us for a long time. You're representing us so well on and off the field. And the work you do for the players, the staff, us, everybody is just incredible. And we wanted to come by and say, Thank you for all that you do. Y'all are bonded as family of the Texans, but now you two are bonded for life in a whole different way. Roland is one of the greatest guys I know. You know, Roland's my brother now. You go through an experience and we've both shared something that not a lot of people can actually share. He saved my life and I love him for it. I mean, he's, like I say, he's my brother now. About a month away from starting training camp, this is Texans 360. I'm Drew Doherty, and we've got a fun story here about Gerard Johnson. He was a Texas A&M quarterback about 13, 14 years ago and set some records. Now he's coaching the quarterbacks for the Houston Texans, and his future, incredibly bright. Gerard Johnson is the Texans quarterbacks coach. With a bright future on the horizon, it got a boost this offseason when he was selected for a very unique NFL program. The NFL invited, I think, 40 coaches from around the NFL um, who they feel have potential in the league to potentially advance their careers as coordinators or potential head coaches. A two days worth of professional development uh, program with speakers and informative things on, you know, just different things that can help us as coaches. And then uh, the cool thing was is they partnered the owners meetings with it. So we were on one side of the hotel, the owners were on the other, and then uh, all of our meals were together. Johnson joined D'Amico Ryan's staff this offseason and he was elated at the opportunity. I actually <laughs> did the interview while we were having our baby shower in Dallas. So I decided to set up in a, in a hotel room and just kind of go through the process there. But I was actually in my house in Humble when I found out and uh, it was just an exciting moment. Nick called me and was just like, hey man, you know, we lo we'd love to have you a part of what we're building here. And then D'Amico called me, then I talked to Bobby. And so uh, uh, those guys did a really good job of vetting me and I got to know them. And that was a big thing, you know, throughout the whole process, you know, just seeing how, you know, sharp Nick was and how, you know, sharp D'Amico was and even Bobby, just knowing I'm going to work with good people. It's a great opportunity for, for me to learn from those guys. Um, and so I'm just excited to be here, you know, excited what we're building. And in the spring has been, you know, best case. But Johnson's not just any old up and coming coach. He's now in charge of the quarterbacks 
for his hometown team. That was one of the best days of my life so far, you know, just knowing I get to come home. I mean, of course, I've always been a, a lifelong Texans fan, you know, growing up in Humble, Texas. I mean, Houston is home. I love the city. Uh, we've had a house here for the last four years. You know, uh, it's where I met my wife, and that's where my wife lives and works. And, and so for us, it just checked so many boxes, and it was just kind of like a dream come true for all of us. Growing up in the Houston area, he was a fantastic athlete in football, basketball, and baseball, just to name a few sports. And it took him to College Station, where he was a record-setting quarterback for the Aggies. I love the quarterback position, and I think that everything that I've done as a player, all the things I experienced as a coach, regardless of level, have kind of all poured into kind of my teaching style, who I am as a person. And I think all those experiences allow me to kind of dive in and kind of give the, as much of me as I can to my players, just hoping they can kind of be the best versions of themselves. Playing at Texas A&M just uh, gave me an understanding of what it takes to one to play football at a high level, but uh, and also the fan base. You know, every day in and out, whether it's a win, you know, and, and dealing with that, and whether it's a loss where you're getting booed out of a stadium, whether you're throwing interception, because I threw a couple my senior year, and, and just dealing with all those different situations, I think really gave me an understanding of what it takes to play the position, the highs and lows, the mindset, um, and what it feels to kind of be the man in the arena. Throughout his pro football journey, both on the field and as a coach and as an assistant, Johnson was blessed to learn from a slew of coaching greats. There's so many guys who've, who've influenced me and it, it, it's beyond levels. I mean, first with my dad, uh, my, my late father, Larry Johnson, was a, the coach and principal at Humble High School. He was one of the first coaches I knew was seen as a coach and that figure was Neil Quillen, uh, was the head coach at Humble High School. And then uh, Walt Beasley was my high school coach. Um, let's see, Mike Sherman, when I was at Texas A&M, is when I really kind of learned the West Coast offense and kind of got my foundation of football. My quarterback coach then was Zach Taylor, so that was that was pretty cool. And then for me to go to the Eagles and kind of get a very, very short stint, be around uh, Andy Reid and all those guys, and then to go and play with the Steelers from Mike Tomlin um, and just how he interacted with the players. And then from a coaching side of things, you know, I really think I spent my first couple years being a quality control for Nick Sirianni and just watching his effort and passion in the games. And then last year with Kevin O'Connell, I think I learned a lot on just offensive football, um, you know, really how to game plan, how to scheme. And so all those guys had a different effect on me, you know, whether I was playing or coaching, and I wouldn't be who I am now if I didn't, you know, interact with all those all of them. For now, though, he's keeping his goals and his focus narrow. The cool thing is I think all of our players have, have made leaps from when we first saw them in OTAs to where they are now. Um, I, I think that's the most exciting part. The players feel improvement. We see improvement as coaches. As coaches, we're working every day so we can get better. We're on the same page. And so I think it's just you look around the room left and right to see people working hard. You see people buying in. And that, bring, that breeds excitement for everybody. We're happy that you're back with us on Texans 360. And we were especially happy when Case Keenum signed with Houston this offseason. It's his third go round with the Texans, and it's the place where he played college football as a Houston Cougar. And speaking of the Cougs, he was back on campus running a quarterback's camp with a twist. Here's more from that fun day with Case. Being able to bring the U of H quarterbacks out, help them, you know, help promote my camp, and being able to give back to the city of Houston and help, you know, quarterbacking, teaching guys, uh, you know, what it means to play quarterback and at the next level, not just, you know, in college but in the pros, uh, and then linking it all in with, uh, you know, with some NIL stuff too for for U of H quarterbacks, man. It's quarterback U. I mean, that's why I named it what it is. I mean, you got Andre Ware, Klingler, Cobb. Keenum and then you know there's there's so many more it's a great list of quarterbacks who have who've come through U of H and it's exciting to, to give back to the next one. We can work on being faster stronger and still maintaining that base even before we're thinking about throwing a football okay this is the training part of it this is the weight room part of it this is the this is the part where you get bigger faster stronger and before you even start throwing the ball so we're gonna do some pocket movement uh, what's the where does throwing the ball start what does it start with that's probably a good, it starts with the snap, yeah, but for us, if when I decide to throw the football, it starts with my feet. I try to go hips first, okay? Hips first. Go! There it is, that's good. Let's see it. Go! Nice, there you go. Oh, the lefty's turning the wrong way. Nice, he throws a strike!
Oh, he's on fire. There we go. Good job. I'm telling you, if you get your feet set, the ball's going to be better. That's a principle across any throwing motion, any body type, any offense you're going to run. Hey, I think you can go more oh. catch throw. Like here, by the time you go one, two, three, and hitch, that receiver's already gone. It's just like, like Coach Jet said, just a little shuffle. If you want to, if you want to do a little rocker step, maybe, but the ball needs to get out pretty quick. You're real wide sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes it's you don't have you don't have to be this wide. You're right here, and I think you're a little more on top of your feet, and you're a little more accurate with the ball. So not so wide. Does that make sense? All right. Let's give it up for Tank, man. He decided to come out today, man. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up for some questions, guys, because because this I mean. He's a pro. Do I get nervous? Yeah, I get nervous before games, I ain't gonna lie, but it's just like, it's like a good nerve. It's not like I'm scared or nothing. I just like, I hold, I hold myself to a high standard. So before a game, I be nervous, but soon the ball hike, like soon I get out there first play, it all go away. So yeah, look at That's a good question, man. I think if you're nervous, that means you care. Yeah. You know, I always feel a little something right here before every game. I played a lot of games. That's a great question. What you got, bud? The main objective was for us to have fun today. Ultimately, um, next we're looking at technique, course footwork. It all starts with the ground uh, work first. Then we started looking at the hips. Is the hips moving before the shoulders? Um, then we worked on a uh, three-step drop back, quick release, five, seven-step drop back, things of that nature. It's a lot of opportunities that a lot of people don't get these days. So just them taking advantage of the opportunity, whatever lesson they could, at least one lesson, whether it be footwork, whether it be hip mechanics, whether it be throwing mechanics, just something and understanding. Take that one tool and utilize it. Build it off a foundation from there. Plant throw. Okay, there's a, that's the three and a plant. There's a three and a hitch throw. One, two, three, and a hitch. And I was stuffing swag bags last night at the house, and my wife and my dad and my whole family, I can't thank them enough for, for helping out. Uh, you know, my coaches that uh, play with me, Cotton Turner, Austin Elrod, Brian Thebaud, Hugh Sandifer, um, you know, guys that I've really taught me the, the game of football, um, that I'm able to come out here and share this experience with, it's fun. Welcome back to Texans 360, and hey, earlier this week, the nation celebrated Juneteenth. Such a memorable day, and it happened in Galveston over 100 years ago. Cecil Shorts III had a very special history lesson with some special folks earlier this year. In anticipation of Juneteenth, Texans legend Cecil Shorts traveled to Galveston to meet with Sam Collins, also known as Mr. Juneteenth, to learn more about the city that became known as the birthplace of Juneteenth. Collins took Shorts to five stops throughout Galveston, which in 1865 was the largest city in the state of Texas. The first was Pier 21 in the Middle Passage, the historical marker commemorating enslaved Africans in Galveston during the late 18th and early 19th centuries and the millions who perished during the Middle Passage. Here uh, at Pier 21 uh, in the harbor in Galveston is where uh, you know all the commercial business was done. And with regards to enslavement, the enslaved people were considered property. And that property was the most valuable asset of the owners in the South, even more valuable than land. The next stop was the Juneteenth historical marker. This was the site of the Union headquarters where General Order Number 3 was written and issued, transmitting the news of the Emancipation Proclamation to Texas residents, freeing all remaining enslaved people. The third stop was the U.S. Customs House, where a copy of General Order Number 3 was posted near the front door and a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation is displayed still today. Shorts then went to the Reedy Chapel and met Diane Henderson. The church was first established in 1848 and was the central place for enslaved people to gather in Galveston. The church has had a number of pastors, as I say, you know, that we move annual conference. First was the Reverend M.M. M. Clark. The second one was Reverend Houston Reedy. The people liked him so much they decided to name the church Reedy Chapel AME. 
as General Granger marched through Galveston spreading the news of the Emancipation Proclamation, Reedy Chapel is one of the last sites where he stopped. It was a place for one of the early Juneteenth celebrations where freed slaves marched from the county courthouse to the church. During the final stop, Shorts went to the Ashton Villas, which is the location of the official Juneteenth statue called the Legislator. It commemorates the date in which June 19 became a state holiday. It was passed in 1979, and the state holiday became official on January 1st, 1980. African Americans have contributed to every war uh, that has been fought in the United States. This is our home, this is our, our country, and if we're gonna save this home, we have to do the repair work to the foundation, we have to do the repair work to the structure so that it will be here for future generations. So I appreciate uh, y'all taking interest in the history and learning more of the story, and uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, we appreciate y'all. This is an awesome opportunity for us, for people back home, in Houston to understand better, uh, whoever's going to be watching this, to understand uh, our history. It's not just African American history, it's our history. And we talked about it history earlier. World history. Yeah. We talked about it earlier. It's, the truth is enough. The truth is enough. It's the truth is enough. Hope you enjoyed the show and we appreciate you watching it. We had fun bringing it to you and we'll do it again next week, same time, same place. So for Gardy Swingby, Tyler Sudarth, and a host of others who made it all happen, my name's Drew Doherty and we'll see you next time on Texans 360. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to know when we post new content.